Uh, my specialties are primarily SCADA systems, automotive systems, uh, medical device testing. Uh, essentially, I really like embedded systems, uh, anything that impacts uh, modern life as we know it. Uh, a lot of times we work with wireless systems uh, and uh, airborne systems. Uh, quick disclaimer, uh, obviously opinions are my own, uh, not my employers. Uh, they're not picking any particular vendors. Uh, even though we try to remove logos, some things are just gonna be way too obvious about uh, who things belong to. Uh, in some cases, when we actually point out a vendor, uh, they're the vendor who are doing things slightly better than others. Uh, so uh, since we're talking about the automotive forensics, this is where the story usually starts. Uh, a wreck, possibly some fatalities, perhaps a fire that uh, one extinguish for, for two or three days. Uh, have you all seen the headlines? Uh, there's often a crash and uh, you see a sensationalized story in the newspaper about uh, the particulars of the crash. How fast the vehicle may have been traveling, about uh, what the driver may or may not have been, uh, been doing, uh, what the driver may not or may not have been uh, using, such as a cell phone or a uh, uh, DVD player at the time. And I'll point out that uh, the article mentions uh, a black box. Uh, I'm sure you've heard all of them uh, about the mention of black box with uh, airplane crashes. Uh, your vehicle also has a black box. Uh, when investigators are working a crash uh, or some kind of an uh, incident, uh, their primary source of data is a black box. Since the black box is actually regulated by Congress, uh, there is a law about uh, what the black, uh, black box data on the vehicle is supposed to contain uh, and for how long. Uh, other common sources, uh, many of our vehicles now have a GPS. If you have one of the newer luxury vehicles, you may have a li uh, LiDAR. Uh, you and your passenger will very likely have a phone, which will also be recording data and shoveling it back to Apple or Google, Chinese government, all three. <laughs> uh, you're typically running a slew of apps, including uh, Waze, uh, Google, again, uh, uh, Apple Play, a uh, number of other applications which may be uh, uh, uploading data in real time. Uh, you may be running uh, an external GPS unit, so it's, uh, such as one of those uh, Garmin units, which constantly puts a, a breadcrumb along your route. Uh, again, a uh, reliable source of data, mostly. Uh, quick mention on LiDAR. Uh, there's two types of LiDAR systems, uh, one that performs uh, real-time acquisition and another which simply uh, tries to get a baseline and it contains an internal database of supposedly all roads that you're supposed to be able to drive and tries to do a uh, quick pattern matching. Uh, again, uh, most modern phones, uh, unless you have a flip phone, uh, has a built-in GPS, uh, has a, obviously a cellular connection, so it's doing GPS traileration. Uh, in order to be E911 compliant, it's constantly trying to determine its position and point in time. Uh, and of course, it's using uh, Wi-Fi technologies such as Skyhook, again, to help uh, narrow down its location, even if Bluetooth and GPS are off or don't currently have a signal. Uh, external GPS units, uh, even US units, uh, in addition to the GPS system, typically have uh, Glossnos, Galileo. Uh, if uh, you're in uh, APAC, you may also be using uh, Baidu or uh, IRNSS. Uh, typical GPS threats, uh, again, we have uh, jamming, spoofing, uh, and uh, detection. Uh, we have uh, RF jamming, which is uh, simply filling up the radio frequency, uh, whether it's L1, L2, or L3 band. Or you can actually have more sophisticated protocol jamming, where you're actually trying to speak GPS protocol, but uh, uh, broadcasting inaccurate data uh, may actually cause seg faults on some of the external units uh, or cause them to lock up, as opposed to just not being able to receive a signal on the typical bands. Uh, you can have an accuracy degradation attack uh, where the quality of the signal may drop from uh, being able to position yourself within three meters or five meters uh, to within several hundred meters. Uh, that would obviously complicate forensics or any kind of incident investigation. Uh, one of the less common attacks is actually enhanced accuracy. Uh, it makes the victim think that they actually have a far better idea of where they are uh, than they actually do. Uh, you can actually uh, make somebody who, uh, who has, uh, for example, 500 meter accuracy think that they have one meter accuracy, which is fine granular, which is basically this amount of space right here, uh, and uh, may make them act uh, rashly or drive faster because they think they know exactly where they are or where they're headed. 
And of course, you have uh, location spoofing, uh, much more sophisticated, uh, more advanced timing attack, uh, requires more hardware, uh, but it has been seen in the wild. Uh, of course, you don't really even have to uh, have a sophisticated attack uh, because uh, people will follow their GPS anywhere. Uh, it's 2018, and uh, this is a screenshot from an old story, but uh, usually I can find five or six of these every single year where the car says turn left and says a boat ramp, and people will drive hey, right in. Uh, GPS spoofing, as I mentioned. Uh, please, please, please call the alarm and be determined. There is no emergency. We are sorry for any uh, Fairly sophisticated attack it requires uh, a lot of resources. Uh, more commonly seen at nation state level, but we have seen it at uh, uh, sophisticated criminal level. Uh, it has been more successful used against ships. Uh, first of all, they're isolated there, they're in the middle of an ocean, there's no street signs, and there's no Wi-Fi or other assistive technology, uh, and they tend to be a more attractive target. Uh, it's possible to obviously divert the ship into unsafe shipping channels, divert the ship uh, uh, towards an underwater obstruction uh, when the ship captain actually thinks that they're sailing through a clear channel. Uh, GPS jamming is uh, dirt cheap. Uh, as little as $12 in some cases from the dongles that we've seen. Uh, from the informal testing that we've done, uh, something like that can actually affect uh, three to four cars around the vehicle that's actually using it. So these are sold to prevent uh, employee tracking. Uh, so if an employer issues you a vehicle, for example, and they want to know where you are, uh, an employee who may want to fuck off during lunch will plug one of these in uh, and their employer is not going to be able to track them, except it will also affect the number of vehicles around them. And then we have uh, some significantly more uh, advanced packages. Uh, some like that will impact several city blocks uh, quite a bit further. Uh, we have a uh, saying in uh, radio, height makes might. So if, for example, you were to take this up in a helicopter with you or to 52nd floor, uh, you're gonna have a much better footprint. Uh, sadly, it's not nation state level attack. It's uh, around $2,000, which again, for a sophisticated attacker is pocket change. Uh, there's very few solutions in the market for detecting GPS jamming uh, or uh, especially GPS spoofing. Uh, we're not going to get too deep in, it in this demo. Uh, so uh, before we move on further, uh, quick definition of what is positioning. Uh, it's not simply location. It's a uh, you want to know your location at a given point in time. Simply saying your home is not enough. We need to know that you're home between certain hours, and we want to know changing location over time. You want to know when you got to the location and when you left that location. Otherwise, the location data is essentially worthless for investigation. Uh, so the so-called vehicle black box, uh, it's actually, well, it's usually not black. Uh, it's actually called an event data recorder. Uh, the Congress has mandated every vehicle uh, produced since 2014 have one. Uh, it typically has five to 20 seconds loop of data recorded, continuously written, and once the body impact sensor, one of the other uh, uh, crash detection, crash prevention systems detects an event, uh, it's going to start saving that data. Uh, and if uh, everything works correctly, it's going to uh, prevent EPROM from being overwritten, uh, which actually doesn't work too well. Uh, so there's 15 data points which have to be written by law. Uh, most systems uh, today uh, use around 30 data points. Uh, some of the most common ones are obviously velocity, which is how we know the vehicle is doing 120 miles an hour. Uh, throttle position, uh, if you've uh, seen some of the headlines about uh, the gas pedal or the brake pedal being stuck, uh, that's how you determine if the driver was lying or if the driver confused the uh, gas and brake pedal, if they were going full throttle or actually trying to brake. Uh, Seatbelt use, very useful in uh, uh, post-mortem if the driver didn't survive uh, or in litigation with the manufacturer. Uh, steering, uh, we can determine whether or not somebody you know, swerved towards the crowd or uh, away from the crowd and if the vehicle skidded. And of course, airbag deployment. Uh, so uh, as much as I hate to mention Tesla, uh, actually Tesla gives us a really good data point whether or not uh, somebody's hands burn the wheel. Again, essential for investigation because we want to know if the human was driving uh, or if the driving assistant was driving. It's not an autopilot, it's a driving assistant. Uh, eye focus. Uh, there is an internal camera which can actually determine if you're looking straight ahead or if you're looking down your phone or uh, messing around with the DVD player. 
uh, and if the vehicle is equipped with LiDAR, uh, it actually uh, is able to save LiDAR data. Uh, for some reason, I can't get the slide to, oh, okay, it is playing, cool. So this is actually what a crash looks like from the standpoint of a Tesla. Uh, this was a crash in a parking lot and this was actually the, uh, the vehicle driver's fault. Uh, they confused the gas and the brake pedal and they hit the townhouse. So uh, pretty useful investigation uh, combined with other data. Uh, for those of you who know a little about forensics, uh, everything, you, even if there is no standard for how something should be done, you have to use scientific methodology, meaning uh, the steps should be recorded, they should be repeatable. Uh, you need to be able to measure the error rates and prove what the error rates are. And you need to try align them with uh, some sort of industry standard that already exists, whether in uh, automotive investigation or in computer forensics. Uh, there's uh, three main ways to interrogate the so-called black box or the event data recorder. Uh, one is roughly a, a $12,000 toolkit. Uh, one is directly over OBD2 port, which is not supported by every manufacturer. Uh, or the other way is to actually crack the device open and connect directly to the EEPROM. Uh, tools, as I mentioned, uh, they are public. You can buy them. Uh, all you have to do is send a $12,000 check. Uh, they also take credit cards. Uh, they refused to send me a free sample, the nerve. <laughs> uh, many of you, well, not many, uh, some, uh, especially U.S. vehicles, uh, do support communication over CAN bus. Uh, so if you actually uh, know the commands, you could download data from the event data recorder over the OBD2. Uh, the communications are encrypted. Uh, again, uh, on certain forms, you can uh, get your hands on the keys, but uh, it's a little bit problematic. Uh, this method, uh, the biggest issue, of course, is that it uh, induces data changes, meaning as you're reading the data, you're actually introducing errant data. Uh, if the black box failed to record data from one of the sensors, which is very common, it's actually going to write errant data. Uh, so the crash is a pretty violent event. Right now, when you're sitting down, you're exposed to one G of force. Uh, during an impact, uh, your vehicle can experience as much as 26 Gs of force, meaning a lot of electronics, even hardened electronics, will fail. So it's uh, not that uncommon to not receive data from sensors for the last uh, few seconds. Uh, again, crashes are non instantaneous events. Uh, it's an elastic collision. It can actually last three to five seconds uh, as uh, all your crumple zones uh, um, meet their final position. Uh, this third method, method is the actually preferred method if you don't have access to a $12,000 tool and uh, you don't want to cause data spoilation. Uh, looks a little overwhelming. All you have to do is uh, find your event data recorder, uh, crack it open, find the EEPROM chip, <laughs> connect the clips, uh, connect the bus pirate and start dumping data. Uh, and hopefully not find anything in the meantime and hopefully videotape everything or uh, uh, preserve data to essentially prove uh, to court if it comes to that uh, what the data was uh, at the time of collection. Uh, I actually have a device with you if you want to practice later in a uh, car hacking village. Uh, this is an event data recorder uh, that was pulled from an American vehicle. Uh, don't look at the label. Uh, this vehicle was involved in a crash but the airbags did not deploy. So some of the interesting things with this, uh, privacy concerns. Uh, many states do not have laws about how or when the data can be pulled from your event data recorder. Even though you own the vehicle, uh, you essentially don't always have a say in uh, whether or not the data can or should be pulled from your vehicle. Uh, we've seen the data pulled in divorce cases, uh, which is absolutely idiotic because I mentioned they can save up to 20 seconds, but some uh, attorneys know that it records uh, vehicle position and they get a court order to pull data from a car and it gets them absolutely nothing useful, but the judge grants them the warrant. Uh, this data is not remotely accessible. Uh, there should be a star next to that. And, uh, the one exception is Tesla. We know the data is stored remotely off-site. Uh, we've actually been able to prove that some super outbacks uh, also store some data off-site. Uh, the luxury models that are fitted with 4G modem uh, will upload and sync data opportunistically. Uh, 
Uh, so, 12 states do have uh, court rulings about search warrant being required by the vehicle. Uh, that means the 38 states currently do not. Uh, the data is considered the property of the vehicle owner. However, after a crash, if your vehicle is towed, uh, you essentially lose control of the vehicle. Uh, the tow truck driver can consent on your behalf, uh, or the police investigator can go out to the garage where your vehicle is stored and start pulling off data, because there are no hard laws about that. Uh, so we mentioned, Warrants. sorry? Even cases where a warrant is required, the police can still go and we can pull the data and after the fact see they act in, in good faith. So unless you have a law in standby that will go and uh, issue an emergency injunction, uh, your SOL because the data has already been pulled off your vehicle and uh, the judge will just rule the police act in good faith. Uh, I mentioned uh, civil lawsuits. Uh, you have uh, the case of people being hurt in, a, in an accident and the dispute is, what, is whether over or not uh, the accelerator was pressed down or whether or not the brake was deployed. Uh, and again, whether or not the person caused the crash by looking down at their phone or whether their uh, automotive driving assistant actually caused the crash. Uh, right now, uh, there's several interesting cases in the courts, uh, both in the United States and China, about liability in the case of uh, the driving assistant being the primary cause of the crash. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, two primary methods of access. Uh, we have the diagnostic port, which for those of you that don't know is this OBD2 port that all of your vehicles have, unless you have a vehicle prior to 1992, 1996. And you have the airbag module, uh, also known as the body impact module. Uh, sometimes they're combined together uh, into one single unit. Uh, if they are combined together, it looks a little bit like that. Uh, typically found under the driver's seat or in between the driver and passenger seat. Uh, it's bolted in pretty well because, again, it needs to be able to uh, feel the impact of the vehicle, feel acceleration, deceleration. Uh, it has a number of sensors on board uh, and an encryption module, uh, which is supposed to encrypt the communication between the CAN bus and the EEPROM chip uh, and a completely unprotected EEPROM chip with no tamper detection and no tamper protection. So uh, direct access over OBD2 is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, now we get to the part of don't try this at home. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you that there's a liability because this module can trigger your airbag. Uh, in a vehicle with multiple airbags, it actually can kill you because an airbag deployment does produce enough force to uh, fracture your skull. Uh, it does have built-in protection, meaning if there's an electrostatic discharge, it's gonna err on the side of caution and deploy the airbags. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, airbag module is often integrated with the black box. Uh, this particular one isn't, but this is actually uh, more of an exception to the rule. Uh, the states that currently have uh, regulations about who can have access to data and when, as I mentioned, the other 35 states are uh, undetermined right now because there's insufficient court rulings or no court rulings. Uh, no cases have come up to the federal level as of yet. Uh, we are monitoring the case in China. Uh, that's uh, due in court, we believe, in October. So that's going to be really interesting. Uh, so some of the interesting takeaways. Uh, the EEPROM chip on board, once you crack the case open, as I mentioned, does not have tamper detection or tamper protection. The chip cannot know when it was last accessed or if the data was written properly by the car sensors or if I opened the chip, uh, opened the body prior and wrote errand data to that chip. Uh, just before the investigators got their hands on it. Uh, no tamper detection. For example, the black box sensor in your vehicle could be modified. There's no way to externally uh, determine it because there's not even a very simple seal over it. As you can see, there's not even a gold foil seal over it. So I can literally just unplug this and plug this in somebody's vehicle. Uh, no protection at all on uh, board or chip level. Uh, there is uh, one manufacturer that sells hardware locks that cover your OBD2 port, but uh, it's a plastic part that covers up a plastic part, so it's uh, essentially protected by goodwill. Uh, sorry, this is a very compressed version of a one-hour-long presentation that just uh, kind of shrunk down to 25 minutes. 
uh, plus a fire alarm. Uh, but uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can take them now, or uh, also you're welcome to play with this uh, after the talk and uh, try pulling data off of it. Any questions? Uh, obviously available uh, to answer questions over email or uh, right outside this room. And I'm uh, not going to hold up the next speaker. Can I ask a oh, yeah, go ahead. Can you talk about commercial vehicles a little bit? <coughs> you got a second? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so commercial vehicles such as 18-wheelers also have uh, these sensors. Uh, the law covered uh, not just uh, uh, personal vehicles. So trucks do have them as well. Uh, they actually typically have more, uh, more loggers because there's a separate one uh, for, the, for the cargo compartment and a separate one for the actual, uh, for the rig. Uh, the modern trucks also collect a lot more data. Uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the Tesla truck is, but uh, some of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a lot of truckers now use uh, dash cams, which again would uh, make great evidence. Uh, truckers are very annoyed with cars cutting them off because they're big and slow, and they do uh, really annoying things like follow the speed limit. Uh, but uh, I have not had a chance to uh, steal a black box from a truck, but my understanding is that they work exactly the same way, uh, simply because of the regulations. Regulations didn't distinguish between uh, uh, buses, trucks, or passenger vehicles. Uh, the legislation only covers the United States, but because the U.S. is such a major consumer, the vehicles that are made uh, to serve the U.S. market uh, are also very similar vehicles to what's made for other countries. Uh, so the black box is still in there. Uh, we know that uh, the vehicles that crash, for example, Saudi Arabia, have the same black boxes because, again, we see the same headlines with the same data being pulled up. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there's integration for the airbag deployment. Yes? Are they putting anything like the ultra caps on the board so that if, if you lose vehicle power during the crash, it'll keep logging? Uh, good question. Yes, one of the screenshots I had, uh, you could actually see a good size capacitor on it. Uh, I'm trying to find the screenshot in a hurry. So, yes, there is a large capacitor. Uh, from what we've seen, it'll give you about 12 seconds of data. Uh, the collision data that I've had access to had lasted for maybe five seconds, at least the important stuff. Thank you. Welcome. All right, thank you folks for coming. Thank you.